some great speakers with us today. And um, yeah, so we'll just go ahead and get started here. But my name is Hallie Hamilton, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Creighton Federalist Society. Our executive board this year is absolutely phenomenal. Charles Kim is our vice president. Nick Sinclair is our treasurer. Wolf Tottenbach is the secretary. Luke Meinholz is our lawyer's chapter liaison. Hal Oberlander is our 3L representative. Jay Park is our 2L representative. And Amelia Renz is our 1L representative. Wow. Uh, Chris Green is our honorary director of graphic design and fully responsible for all of our excellent flyers. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least is our faculty advisor, Professor Colin Mangrum. Um, I know he was going to try to join us, but I'm not sure if he's been able to. So um, if, when you see Professor Mangrum around, thank him for um, sponsoring the Federalist Society as our faculty advisor. Um, and I also spoke with, and we have great support from Dean Berche and Dean McFadden, and they hope to be in attendance as well. So if you are here, thank you so much for being here. The mission of the Federalist Society is to reorder the priorities of the legal system to place a premium on individual liberty, traditional values, and the rule of law, and to restore these norms among lawyers, judges, law students, and professors. In working to achieve these goals, the society has created a conservative and libertarian intellectual network that extends to all levels of the legal community. The network is committed to three key principles. First, the state exists to preserve freedom. Second, the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution. And third, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is not what it should be. And Creighton's core, the Creighton chapter's core values are curiosity, communication, and courtesy. And before we officially begin, I want to run through just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, the first is membership with Federalist Society. So we have a national organization that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we would encourage all of you, if you're interested in being um, involved with the Federalist Society, connected to FedSoc, you should become an official member with FedSoc. You can go to fedsoc.org forward slash join, and it's just $5, and they connect you with tons of awesome resources, um, along with access to these types of Zoom events that happen all over the country with really incredible speakers. Um, I've joined a handful of them on different occasions, so... Um, it's just a really, really neat resource to be a part of that. So we'd encourage you to join that. And when you join, be sure to tell them you're at Creighton Law School. Um, there's a place for you to designate a law school and designate that so that we know about it too. Um, today, we have an exciting presentation by Professor Josh Blackman, followed by a commentary from Professor Paul McGreal. Um, after the presentation, there will be time for Q&A, moderated by our secretary, Wolf Tottenbach. Uh, Professor Blackman and Professor McGreal have correctly agreed to stay an additional 10 minutes after the meeting sort of officially concludes at 1 to answer additional questions for students who can remain on the call. So during Q&A, we'll primarily be using the chat function, um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, also, you know, today's event, we've opted for a traditional Zoom call rather than a webinar. So we'd appreciate it if you turn your cameras on and your microphones off. And if you abuse the chat function or are unreasonably <laughs> distracting, you may be either muted or booted off the call entirely by Charles Kim, our vice president and uh, co-host of today's event. So, uh, and all, as always, the, the views expressed in today's event are not representative of Creighton University and should be considered the perspective of the speakers alone. So now I'd like to invite our treasurer, Nick Sinclair, to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Hallie. Uh, allow me first to introduce our distinguished guest of honor, Professor Josh Blackman. Professor Blackman comes to us all the way from the Lone Star State teaches at South Texas College of Law in Houston, specializes in constitutional law, 
anything and everything Supreme Court related. And he's on the cutting edge in technology and how that interacts with the law. Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes magazine for their 30 under 30 list in law and policy. Professor Blackman has testified twice before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and health care. He is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He is the founder and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS and blogs at joshblackman.com. Professor Blackman is the author of three books, nearly five dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, LA Times, and many other national publications, and we are happy to have him here today. And providing commentary on a discussion outlined by Professor Blackman is Creighton Law School's very own Professor Paul McGreal. Uh, he teaches constitutional law and property here, and he's a frequent writer, speaker, and commentator on corporate compliance and ethics. He also teaches a course on leadership and conflict engagement in Creighton's master's program in negotiation and conflict resolution. Professor McGreal began his law career as a law clerk for Justice Warren Matthews of the Alaska Supreme Court. He then moved on to working in Dallas, or Baker Botts LLP. And like Professor Blackman, Professor McGreal moved on to teaching at South Texas College of Law, oh. where he taught for 10 years. Later, he served as a professor of law and associate dean at Southern Illinois University School of Law. After that, he was the dean of University of Dayton School of Law from 2011 to 2014. He has also published over 40 articles and essays in law journals and schools, including University of Notre Dame, Northwestern, University of Pennsylvania. So without further ado, we'll give the Zoom floor to Professor Blackman. And on behalf of the Creighton Federalist Society, I just want to say I'm very excited to watch this Texas two-step between these two sharp legal minds. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I was actually supposed to give this talk last year. Um, we had to cancel it because I was invited to testify uh, before Congress. Of course, that hearing was canceled, so we had to put that on hold. Then we rescheduled for the spring semester, and once again, COVID happened. So I had to cancel twice. This is my third chance at coming to Creighton, and I'm happy to finally do so now. All right, how's this working? Everyone see me okay? All right. You may have not seen this before, but this is the, I think, the better way of doing Zoom PowerPoints. I hate PowerPoints, but I think this actually might, uh, <laughs> this might work a little bit, um, I work a little bit better. All right. So the topic today is the First Amendment, Second Amendment, and 3D printed guns. Um, and this is a topic that I have a lot of familiarity with. I've been litigating this issue now for nearly five years. Um, I represent the company in Texas that actually developed the first 3D printed firearm. And we've been litigating this case all the way up and down the courts forever. Uh, so at the outset, let's discuss 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is a novel technology. It allows you to take a design on the screen, whether it's a car or a house or anything else, and convert it into a real-life physical object. Okay. So let's consider an easy example of how 3D printing operates. This is a little bit of code. If you have no background in coding, that's quite all right. But let's say that you want to design a cylinder, right? A tube. You would tell a computer to make a cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius of 5 inches. And with that simple code, you've just designed a cylinder. Now, as you may know, the most basic component of a gun is called the barrel, which is basically a cylinder. Congratulations, I just told you to make a gun, right? There's nothing novel about making gun parts on a 3D printer. It's quite simple. Just it was never done before until a couple of years ago. You can make all sorts of gadgets and gadgets with a 3D printer. Um, things that are translucent, things that are transparent. 
And this is what a 3D printer actually looks like. Uh, here they're producing a race car, um, which is a pretty sophisticated object, but it works quite well. You can even make parts of the human anatomy. This is a design of a human brain. Now, how does a 3D printer actually work? Well, I'm sure many of you have made a candle before, right? A candle. Okay, how do you make a candle? You take the wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax, you pull it out. You keep dipping it one after another after another, right? 3D printing works in a very similar fashion, but instead of dipping a wick into wax, you spray. You spray a very thin layer of plastic, one layer on top of the other, 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 until you actually get, in this case, an entire ball that's created. And the plate, the bed moves around underneath it, so it kind of adjusts wherever you need to spray. All right. Uh, here's another design, and this one actually has what's called a heated bed, where it heats up the, the base that the, that the plastic might stay a little bit uh, a liquidy before it solidifies. Okay. So I want to show you now a demonstration. Let me do a little contest. Uh, this is going to be a 3D printer printing an object, which you should know what it is. I want people to type into the, see if this works. People type into the chat when they see what I'm trying to print. Okay. I've done this before in person, but now I'll zoom. Let's see how it works with zoom. All right. So here is step number one. You have this sort of honeycomb, this, this hexagonal base. Number two, gets a little taller. Number three, gets a little taller. Four, all right, anyone see it yet? Hmm, five, anyone see it yet? Just go right in the chat, see if this works. Oh boy, you got it. I think Jeff and Charles came in at the exact same time. It's, it's Yoda, that's pretty good. That is really impressive. Let's see guys, ready? Five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten. There it is. Now everyone sees it, right? It's actually not Baby Yoda, so technically I think uh, Charles gets it. But but I'll I'll give I'll give partial credit. Eleven, old Yoda. <laughs> That's right. Twelve, thirteen, the OG Yoda, right? Fourteen, fifteen. We split in the riches. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Okay. Now, I am not artistic, maybe you are, but I could not create this design for the life of me. It would not even be possible. If you gave me a block of clay, I could not sculpt this. If you gave me a, a, a block of stone, I could not chisel this. If you gave me a thing of wood, I could not carve this. But if you gave me a 3D printer, I can make this. And so can you. Uh, 3D printing allows you to create something, even if you're not uh, artistic and, and have good hand-eye coordination, which I frankly don't. In fact, my, my hands disappear when I move them over here. They just, they just vanish because of Zoom. They go into the ether. Um, but 3D printing is a cool technology. But I'm not here to talk about printing baby Yodas. That's not why Haley invited me three times to come here. I'm here to talk about, of course, guns. Um, 3D printed guns, and that, that's why you all want me to talk about this topic. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the Liberator. The Liberator was the first fully designed 3D printed firearm that was fully functional. This is the blueprint, the design of the barrel. Remember, a barrel is just a cylinder. This is the cylinder, the barrel used the Liberator. Um, Defense Distributed, the company I represent, made a number of products. Uh, for example, this is a lower, uh, a lower receiver for an AR-15, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, they also printed magazines, which are basically the boxes that hold the bullets. Um, but what really made Defense Distributed famous is this. What the heck is this? This is the Liberator. These are the parts needed to build a fully functional 
fire. I mean, it's the original Charles. There have been newer versions. This was the, the, the original version. So what are we looking at? Well, from left to right, the blue thing is the handle. That's what holds the gun. Uh, the sort of triangular piece next to it is the receiver. This is what actually holds the, the firing mechanism. Uh, you can see in the bottom, if I move out of the way, there's the little barrel, the little cylinder. There's a small 22 caliber bullet, which is a very low caliber bullet. You can see a, a, a metal nail. This is just a standard nail. Uh, the nail is used as a firing pin. That's what strikes the back of the bullet and causes the gun to explode. Okay, Josh, what are those little squiggly things? The little, you know, like these. Those are the firing pins. You pull them back, and it's like a spring. It snaps back into action. And that's what causes the gun to fire. Um, these are all very simple, 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 simple parts. Um, dangerous, though. Matt says, hopefully it doesn't explode. Um, making a gun out of plastic is not very smart. Why? Well, plastic has some really bad properties. When plastic gets hot, it melts. And when plastic gets cold, it cracks. Right? Think about a gun. You start firing one after the other, and it gets really hot. Right? And when you put it down, it cools off. Um, that's a problem for a gun. Steel is a good quality. It expands when it gets hot and it contracts when it gets cold. But if you have a 3D printed gun, <laughs> you're in trouble. Why? Let me show you this picture. This is what the Liberator looks like fully assembled. See this rope over here? This, this yellow rope in the side? Why do you think there's a rope in this picture? I'll tell you. Testing. When they were first designing prototypes of this gun, they were not sure it could withstand the combustion. So if you were to hold the gun in your hand and pull the trigger and it blows up in your hand, you have no more hand, right? So they would tie a rope to the trigger and stand 15 feet away and pull it. There were many failed attempts. If you do not make the plastic gun correctly, you're going to kill yourself. This is more likely to hurt the shooter than anyone else. This is a stupid, terrible way of making a gun. It could take you 40 hours of labor to produce a gun that won't even withstand the combustion. It's not a good gun at all. You basically have to treat the plastic with this acetone bath to harden it enough that it can withstand the pressure, but don't make it too hard that it just cracks because it's so stiff, right? It's this very um, bizarre balance you have to reach, and it's not easy. By the way, I have never even fired one. I've never even held one. I've, I mean, I've, been, I've been representing this company for years. I've never even fired one of these guns. Uh, just it's not important to me. Uh, but these are the, these are something that are not very smart to do. Um, you know, fears about them are simply unreasonable. These are not guns that anyone would ever want to actually use in combat or any sort of mission. Um, yet, still, the Liberator made international headlines. It went around the world. Uh, it was downloaded, oh, God, millions of times, this file. People didn't actually print it because it's too hard, but they downloaded the files. All right. I think Matt's right. This is mostly a novelty. But more than that, I think it's an ideological statement. This was a symbol that um, gun controllers cannot control everything. And that's why it makes people so scared, because the state cannot control these like the other modes of commercial sales of firearms. So is there a problem? Is there a problem? Is this illegal? Right? Is there anything illegal about the Liberator? Well, when I say 3D printed guns, this is what people have in mind. Like you just press print and a fully functional handgun pops out, which is far from the truth, not even close. Because there's a long history of people making their own guns. What might be called a zip gun. I'm sure many of you in the audience know what these are. Um, I found this design on the internet uh, for a zip gun. You combine a soldering iron with a garden hose nozzle, and you've made a gun, right? All you need to make a gun is some sort of tube that can withstand the pressure of the firing. That's it. That's really all you need. There's not much more to it. Guns are fairly easy to make. Um, I found this um, blueprint online also. Just don't Google this when you have time. This is dangerous stuff. 
It's a keychain flashlight that was hollowed out and made into a gun. So this looks like a keychain flashlight it would probably make it through airport security. Um, it's just, you know, it's a flashlight keychain, whatever. They're made of metal. Uh, and it has a tiny round in it, and you can fire one shot. You just go, you go pop, and it goes right there. Um, you don't need a $20,000 3D printer to make a gun. In fact, I'm going to show you a demonstration. Now, please, 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 please do not try this at home. Do not try this at home. These idiots, um, I use the word idiots lightly, but these are idiots are going to make a rifle out of a piece of rubber tube and a metal pipe. They're gonna make a shotgun. And you see the recording on a flip phone, so you know this is serious, this is legit, right? They got the flip phone out. Uh, this video's a little bit dated, but you know, you know they were serious about it. So at the end of this metal pipe is this little dimple. And this dimple is gonna be the firing pin. So we're gonna strike the back of the shotgun shell. So what happens, you load the shotgun shell into this rubber tube. And by the way, rubber tube would not trigger a metal detector. It's completely undetectable. And see what they're gonna do. They're gonna jam the back of this metal pipe. Charles is shaking his head. They're gonna jam the back of this metal pipe into the shotgun shell. Now, look at where they're firing. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Well, first off, you see they're shooting at a cardboard box indoors, right? So we're, we're in trouble here. There are several holes in this cardboard box. They've done this before. But what's even worse, look behind the cardboard box. See those electrical cables coming out of the outlet on the top, the yellow wires? Here, let me show you the next frame because you can see it with more focus. Right, there's a fan that's plugged in, right? You see the fan. Um, they are firing indoors at a wall which has a live electrical cables over it. And yes, Rory, you're right. His hand is over the barrel of the gun. <laughs> so when I said these guys are idiots, um, you know, I wasn't being mean. I, I think we can, you know, the the, the objective standard, whatever who, who, torture professor would agree with me, um, this is really bad. This is really bad safety technique. This is really bad everything, right? But they're going to do it. Not a reasonably prudent person. No, 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 no. All right. So ready? They're going to fire it. Ready, guys? One, two, boom. Whoa. Look, you just made a rifle out of a rubber tube and a pipe. I can go to Home Depot and pay like maybe $5 and buy those parts, right? $10 maybe, you know, if you want to buy nicer rubber tubing. Um, you don't need a $20,000 3D printer and 40 hours of labor to make an undetectable firearm. The reason why I show this insane demonstration is to prove to you that, that much of the concern about 3D guns is simply paranoia, right? It really is. This is not something that we should be worried about. There's so many better ways of making dangerous weapons. Um, so many better ways of making dangerous weapons. This is not a global scourge, right? This is something that just scares people because it sounds spooky. All right. Look how proud they are. They have a little shotgun shell, right? They have, uh, you know, it's smoking. Um, and you can see the spent cartridge. All right. So do these guys, these idiots, break the law? Um, I'll just assume they're not in California, New Jersey. Um, under federal law, they didn't break any federal laws. In fact, in most states, it's perfectly legal to make your own firearm. The ATF agrees with this. As long as you're not selling it, that is, you're not putting it into the stream of commerce, you are allowed to make your own firearms. That's actually a very easy um, federal law. So then what's the problem? Well... The government hasn't gone after 3D printed guns because of gun control laws. They've done something different, perhaps unexpected. They've tried to shut down the file sharing, right? Matt's exactly right. They've tried to shut down the way that these files are put on the internet. And they've used 
export control laws, laws limiting exports to restrict file sharing. Now, you may have heard the news that uh, the Trump administration tried to shut down TikTok and tried to shut down WeChat. And, you know, courts just swoop into action. No, you can't do that. First Amendment, you can't close down internet sharing sites. That's just unconscionable. Yeah, well, when involves guns, they can do it just fine. Uh, we've been litigating this case for years. And, you know, with, with Second Amendment litigation, um, courts are never in a hurry, right? For everything else, courts are in a hurry. They issue a nationwide injunction in five seconds. Uh, when involves guns, like, you know, we can just drag it out and take our time and take five years to litigate the exact same case. Uh, this is this is a world we live in with Second Amendment litigation. But let's focus on the First Amendment first. At the most basic level, the First Amendment protects against what are called prior restraints of speech. The government cannot stop you from speaking at a general level. Um, they can punish you after the fact for what you said, but there's a strong presumption against stopping people from speaking in the first place. Um, that includes speaking about dangerous stuff. Uh, back when books were still a thing, there was a thing called the Anarchist Cookbook. And now there's the internet, you don't need a book. But back in the day, you would buy this book. <laughs> Rory says, good read. You would buy this book, and it was basically a terrorist hand guide. I'm only slightly exaggerating. Um, this would teach you how to make bombs, how to make poison, you know, all these pretty dangerous things. And governments try to keep the anarchist cookbook off the shelves. They say, we can't have this. People might use it to commit crimes. It's too dangerous. And consistently, the court said, you cannot ban books. That's just a no-no. If you're banning books, you're in trouble. So you may ask, Josh, wait a minute. We're not talking here about a book. We're talking about code. Well, information is speech. And this is an area where I think the court has today been pretty consistent. Oh, that might change in the future. Uh, for example, in a case called Sorel v. IMS Health, the court said that the information, I'm sorry, the creation and dissemination of information are speech. So there, there's a first amendment right to share information. Well, that, that may change in the near future. Uh, everything around us is governed by code. And I think this is an important aspect of, of our polity. But we also have the second amendment, right? I promise you two amendments, you get two. Uh, the Second Amendment guarantees a right to keep and bear arms. Uh, what does that right mean? Well, not everyone agrees, but in a case called D.C. v. Heller, the Supreme Court said that this right is individual in nature. That's not a collective right connected to militia service. And I will just presume Heller's correct for present purposes. I'm happy to take questions on it uh, later. And two years after Heller, there was a follow-up case called McDonald v. Chicago, and McDonald held that the Second Amendment right is incorporated, that is, the states are bound to recognize the right to their arms. Uh, as a result, the Chicago handgun ban was declared unconstitutional. And there's a picture of Dick Heller with Otis McDonald um, at the Supreme Court. Now, how exactly does the Second Amendment apply to 3D printed guns? And I think it applies in one and maybe two ways. Um, at the most basic level, I think the Second Amendment protects the right to acquire arms. Now, there's still, under Heller, um, licensing regimes where some people can't buy guns and they have to do paperwork. And I'm not challenging any of that. But at the most basic level, you have the right to acquire guns. I'll give you an example. During the COVID pandemic, a number of jurisdictions tried to ban the sale of all guns. And they said, well, it's too dangerous. People can spread corona in a store of uh, guns, so we need to ban it. And... and Surprisingly, the court said you can't have an outright ban, right? Maybe you restrict the hours, maybe you impose distancing requirements, but you can't prohibit the only mechanism of acquiring a gun. So in this part, I'm actually fairly confident, right, that you have the right to acquire a gun. But there's another right that might be a little bit more unfamiliar, which is what you call the right to make arms, the right to make arms. And this is a right that I think is far more deeply rooted in American history. Um, long before you could buy a gun at a gun store or a sporting goods store, if you wanted a gun, you would make it, right? The the militia members in 1776 were not buying guns at Walmart, right? They were actually making their own arms. And I think it's a fairly deeply rooted right to make your own guns. Indeed, in every state in the Union, except for New Jersey and California, you can make your own gun. 
right? You can't sell it. That's a problem. You can make your own weapon for self-defense. Um, I think when you have these right to acquire arms and the right to make arms, the Second Amendment comes into focus. And it, what might be called a, it, what, it might be called what's called a hybrid right, uh, a hybrid right where the First and the Second Amendment reinforce each other. So let me give you a classic example, right? Uh, what if I passed a law that says it's a crime to wish one a Merry Christmas, right? An actual one Christmas, right? It's a crime to wish one a Merry Christmas. Is that a violation of free speech? Or is that a violation of free exercise of religion? Or both? When one right reinforces another, the courts have said there's a greater standard of scrutiny. And I think this analysis helps understand 3D printed guns. The government isn't merely shutting down speech about whatever. It's shutting down speech about how to exercise the right to keep and bear arms. And so the, the First and Second Amendment sort of interact and they reinforce each other in this litigation. All right, so what laws are actually on the books? There's an old statute from the 1980s called the Undetectable Firearms Act. Uh, most of you were not even born when the statute was enacted in 1986. I'm sorry, 88. Still, you weren't born either. Uh, this law requires this law requires any firearm to have a certain quantity of metal in it. Here, let me get out of the way. It's always reversed. A certain quantity of metal in it to trigger a metal detector. So you have to have at least some quantity of metal inside the firearm. Okay? So a purely plastic gun would be illegal under federal law. Now, why do we have this statute? Well, 3D printed guns are novel, but plastic guns are not. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest fears of the Glock handgun was that it would be this plastic gun, which it obviously wasn't. Um, I recently watched <laughs> Die Hard 2, um, which is on HBO Max if you ever you subscribe. And there's this great line from a Bruce Willis character, John McClane, who plays this, this cop. And he's at, he's at an airport, and he's, he has this line, and I'll read it. it. I can't do justice to Bruce Willis. He says, luggage, that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up in airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Now, everything he said is false. Uh, there is no Glock 7. That model does not exist. It's not made of porcelain. It's made of metal with some plastic in it. Uh, it's not made in Germany. It's made in Austria. Um, it will show up in an airport extra machine, and they're quite affordable. But this paranoia of plastic guns predates uh, 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 the modern era. People have just been afraid of this forever. Okay. Now, uh, are there bans on 3D guns? Well, you ask me again in January. But at least for now, uh, there aren't. Uh, there were efforts some years ago to ban 3D printed guns, and that legislation stalled in Congress. Um, I've seen some crazy proposals to ban the plastic used to make 3D guns. Well, guess what, guys? You can 3D print metal. Oh, yes, you can. Um, this is a 1911 handgun that's 3D printed. You would never know it. It looks normal. You hold it. You feel it. It's got good weight, balance. feels normal. Fully functional. It also costs $40,000. <laughs> which is something that I don't think anyone would want to ever actually print because it's so expensive, right? Why would you want to print a $40,000 handgun they can buy for a few hundred bucks? All right, that's the world we live in. Um, now, how have the feds actually tried to regulate 3D printed handguns? I think someone put it in the chat earlier uh, today. Um, someone asked, is your proposal to ban tools that can be used for gunsmithing. I've seen these proposals. They're not credible. The real way of shutting this down is actually through not stopping the end product, but stopping the sharing with files to get through in the first place. Now, I can tell you all, if you want a file on the internet, you're going to get it, right? You're going to find it. This is so stupid, right? Trying to stop the spread of information is just not going to work. In fact, banning the spread of information makes it more desirable to people. Like, oh, I can get it, right? It's almost like a challenge. So all this stuff is just a waste of time. You cannot stop the signal. I know government thinks they can, but it's just, 
information wants to be free. So let's just talk about the law for a minute, but recognize that these things are just not going to work. They can't. Um, there's a system of regulations which you may have never heard of, maybe some of you have, called ITAR, uh, which is the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Um, these regulations, I think, make some sense in the abstract, right? Uh, they were largely enacted during the Cold War, and the idea was we should not be shipping weapons, arms, to enemies. Okay, that makes sense, right? If I want to send a Stinger missile to Afghanistan... I should probably seek the government's permission first, right? If I want to send the blueprints for a nuclear submarine to China, I should probably seek the government's permission first. I think we can all agree that those are probably good ideas. Um, you know, uh, I think that's a good idea. But in recent years, the government has begun to extend ITAR not only to physical munitions, but also to so-called technical data. So for example, a cryptography algorithm used to encrypt, the government has asserted that is subject to the ITAR. Um, more recently, in 2013, the Obama administration extended this even further. They argue that putting files on the internet about 3D printed guns is itself a violation of the ITAR. These are files that anyone can get available anywhere on the internet. But by putting them online so people can get them outside the country, they said this is a this is an export of illegal arms. And the government ordered defense distributed to take down the files. To take down the files. It was a takedown order from the government. Now, uh, Defense Distributed actually complied with this order. They complied with this order. But they also decided to fight back. This letter was sent in 2013. In 2015, Defense Distributed sued the federal government. And I am honored to be one of their attorneys. Uh, we've been litigating this case now for, oh my God, five years. Five years. We have been up and down the courts. We've been sued. And we've sued in New Jersey, California, Seattle, Texas, Pennsylvania. Um, we are currently in both the Fifth Circuit the Ninth Circuit, and the Third Circuit at the same time. Um, it's a very long litigation. It will take me forever to even explain it. Maybe I can do it during the Q&A a bit. But this is the litigation that's been going on forever. Um, our hope is that sooner or later, uh, we'll get this case up to the Supreme Court. It's always our hope. Uh, but it takes forever. If you, ever, if you ever do a civil rights litigation, you'll find that some cases move quickly when the courts want to move quickly. In other cases, take forever when the courts want to drag their feet. And in gun cases, feet are dragged consistently. All right. I will stop here and turn over to Professor McGreal for some comments. And then I welcome your thoughts later. Thank you all so much. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Professor Blackman. Um, and please give my best to uh, the number of friends that I still have down there in South Texas. Just a wonderful place. Um, that we have in common. Um, I will also mention, uh, thank you, Haley, and uh, others for the invitation to be here. I was struck by your use at the beginning of this to say that this is the beginning of COVID season or the first event during COVID. I hope this doesn't become like baseball season. You know, it's like the uh, opening day of COVID season that we're going to endure um, every day, every year for the rest of our lives. So hopefully we'll be back in, in person sooner rather than later. So a couple of, uh, I'm going to keep this brief. Um, first of all, uh, I want to just say for the Second Amendment part, uh, like Professor Blackman, I will say, I will assume Heller is uh, appropriately decided. Uh, for those who are interested in additional stuff on Second Amendment, I would uh, personally, I like the writing of someone named Calvin Johnson, who does a really good job of looking back into the history of the writing 
uh, around the Second Amendment language, looking at sources that spoke uh, the same words at that time to see what was appropriate. Uh, on hybrid rights, I won't say a whole lot, uh, except that my impression of hybrid rights is it's like the island of misfit cases, uh, that we end up with uh, hybrid right cases sometimes, not always, but uh, many times, because there's a case that the Supreme Court, it's not directly on point, they don't want to overrule, but they want to, don't want to give the impression that it's um, that it stands on a particular, myth. for example, Wisconsin versus Yoder, uh, the right of the Amish to not send their children to, uh, to public schools at up to or after a certain age. The court was hesitant to say that was free exercise, but then it also had parental rights, so there's a little bit there, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, um, uh, which deals with uh, sending children to private uh, religious school. Again, I think there's a little bit of religion, a little bit of that. Um, Carrie versus Population Services, which deals with ad advertising and contraceptives. So I just wonder, I mean, I appreciate the effort to um, perhaps give um, a particular claim a little bit more rocket fuel behind it. Um, so whereas, and I, and I agree, Professor Blackman, the observation that Second Amendment claims have a little bit more lethargy um, in the judiciary. Now, again, I'll leave aside whether that's appropriate or not, et cetera. Uh, but there certainly is a sense that, uh, that, in fact, Justice Thomas has said, it doesn't get the same um, scrutiny and same energy behind it. And so I would appreciate the attempt to try to bolster that with First Amendment, um, which I think there would be consensus, well, historically, there's been strong application scrutiny of. Uh, but again, I just wonder and raise the question about whether the hybrid rights project overall is one um, that is, uh, is one to continue with or whether it's just sort of a legacy Court's unwillingness to deal with precedents uh, that are perhaps inconsistent with some of its decisions. So, the First Amendment stuff, uh, a few brief comments. Uh, one is I would also agree with him that to some degree the whole 3D gun stuff on the First Amendment side and code um, is not something to get bogged down. Uh, that it would be, I would be tr uh, troubled and worried if it became the, the focus or the basis for making. Uh, law on the First Amendment side about coding speech. I can uh, remember that my first exposure to this idea of coding speech was way back when, in fact, I was down in Houston at the time. Uh, Napster came around, there was concern about ripping files off of CDs. Uh, the music industry had put uh, in place on, uh, on CDs and other media um, uh, soft or code that would supposedly keep people from taking the copyrighted material off and then sharing the files. And then there were others who were trying to create code that would break the code that the music industry had put on there to protect the, the rights. And so there was litigation uh, as the government tried to ban and the music industry was looking for regulation that would ban this pirated code um, to try to break through the security. Uh, there was a question about whether this code was speech. Um, I think the Ninth Amendment had a decision that spoke to that a little bit. And so I've been interested in this since then. And another manifestation of this recently is when uh, Apple was asked to create code to break into an iPhone that was um, secured and locked, but potentially had uh, information. It was an iPhone of someone who was a suspect in a murder. Uh, and they thought that there might be evidence or information on that phone to be useful to uh, law enforcement. And Apple made the argument, you can't make us speak. To make us draft code is to force us to speak, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said you can't compel speech. And so I, I think that's where a lot of this is going to be around, privacy, cybersecurity, etc. Uh, and so it is, I, I think, a deeply interesting question about whether code is speech. And uh, and I would be worried or concerned if an issue, again, I think uh, Professor Blackman really frames this nicely, um, around something that is largely symbolic given the relatively futile nature of producing guns in the way uh, that he described with 3D printing, um, as well as the fact that the code is out there publicly. Uh, to make law around that about whether code is speech um, might warp a landscape where the battleground is going to be more fertile in other areas. So a few of the uh, observations I have around this code is speech area. One is I think that um, a lot of the writing around this starts to look at analogy. Well, there are words and there are, there are symbols, there are this, there are that, or it's like this, it's like that. Um, however, I think these analogies uh, can break down pretty quickly uh, or can be unhelpful. So, for example, you know, 
telling Apple to create code, well, you're telling them to write something that will have letters and numbers, things we associate with speech and words, etc. But you can also make an analogy that all you're doing is asking them to get you the key or a Chromebook. That's not speech. And so, you know, if we're trying to make analogies to what is and is not speech, define in some abstract sense what speech is and is not, I worry that that is um, a problematic venture. Uh, one that might not be principled. Also, when I think about what code is doing, it seems an awful lot like what machines have done for forever. Uh, uh, the philosopher and writer of um, Friedrich Hayek had this idea, and others have this idea of tacit information, tacit knowledge. When I start a car, all I need to know is push the button while my foot is on the brake. That's all I need to know. But embedded in that is a whole bunch of information tacit information about how that works that I don't need to know. Uh, but it's there. In fact, one measure of the wealth of a society is how much tacit information there is. How much stuff I don't need to know that makes the stuff work that I like to use. Well, if that information is speech, you know, if we start to go down that road, I, I agree, Sorrel has some language in there about information speech. If that information is speech, then it seems like almost any object, I mean, heck, a human being um, is a form of speech. Uh, you know, my brain... <laughs> tells my muscles to do this, uh, or tells my uh, pancreas to release this, etc. So if we start using metaphors around speech and what tells this and communicates that and information, I, now I'll say at the very end what, what might be the substitute. I'm not quite sure how helpful that would be. So for example, the Sorrel case, my reading of it is, with this information idea, it was information about um, prescribed or prescription behavior of doctors. What really seemed to be motivating the court there was, what they did with it, or the what the government was trying to prohibit, uh, the use the government was trying to prohibit the information from being made for. Because the government was like, well, we like some people to have this information about prescriber behavior. We don't want these people to have it because they'll use it to try to persuade doctors to prescribe or to persuade patients that they need these drugs. And so what the courts seemed to be more concerned about was the purpose of preventing a certain type of speech by a certain type of individual as opposed to the free flow of information in the abstract. And that brings me to another case that I've been pondering over a lot, a case called Weed versus Town of Gilbert, where a town had prohibited a whole bunch of different types of signs. I mean, and, and depending on whether it's a political sign or a sign from a bent, this big, that big, located here, located there, there was some language in there from Justice Thomas that suggested a, a really sort of flat out you ought to protect all speech content-based, any discrimination based on content is problematic. I do think, though, that there's some pretty good room in some of the other opinions, including a key concurrence of justices in the majority, that would take away the majority, that suggests that if you regulate speech because of its function, because of what it does, that doesn't get strict scrutiny. So, for example, if you regulate, they even gave an example, speech that is for a one-time only event. That's probably not content-based, doesn't this So it's function. And so, I, I, again, I don't know where this is going. But I think there's some daylight to, to be concerned about or to question whether speech based on its, regulated based on its function, um, it gets the highest level of scrutiny, as well as this sort of definition of what is speech, what is inherently expressive, might be another way to put it. So at the end of the day, what do we then look to? Um, I think there's some pretty good writing by someone named uh, Larry Alexander that says what we ought to be looking at is why is the government making this? Does it, is it trying to prevent the dissemination of ideas? Um, is that the target of it? Is it trying to put its finger on the scale in favor of certain viewpoints uh, and against others? Or is it trying to seek some other regulatory objective? There's a body of case law in First Amendment that talks about secondary effects and this idea. I'm not quite sure how helpful that is here, but it at least is roughly analogous. But this idea of why the government is regulating, um, uh, I think, may be a more fruitful ground in looking at this stuff than trying to define what is in speech or isn't, um, uh, as well as uh, what is, uh, uh, the, for example, the function of speech uh, versus other purposes of regulating. So again, so that we can have um, hopefully robust questions, um, I will leave it there and uh, look forward to the conversation we're going to have, as well as uh, after. All right. Thank you so much. And I think we have a queue. I'm happy to take some questions. All right.
right. First up in the queue is uh, Matt. Go ahead. So uh, talking about regulating speech by function, isn't that really already part of the jurisprudence? Because certain forms of speech, political expression, for example, come in for heightened scrutiny on any restrictions uh, vis-a-vis commercial speech, for example. Isn't that, isn't that correct? Mr. McGrill, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure I'd call it, you know, th- you have to look at the way the cases go through this stuff. I'm not quite sure I'd call it a pure function test. Um, so, for example, commercial speech um, itself was uh, completely open to regulation, and there's been more sort of a movement to greater regu- uh, greater First Amendment protection um, as well. And I think you could say that perhaps the basis is based on function, but I'm not quite sure that that would be the basis. Because if you look at the cases that, that talk about commercial speech, Central Hudson and others, as well as the fact that Justice Thomas and others have flirted with giving full protection to commercial speech, I, I'm not quite sure it traces a function analysis as much as sort of a balancing of different interests um, about why the government might have a, a reason to limit uh, the, uh, the speech that's made for the purpose of, a, of proposing a commercial transaction, as well as why it could, should be protected. Uh, you know, and then, you know, does political speech get heightened protection? I guess it depends on where you're, you're, you're discussing it. And certainly the court talks about that being at the core of the First Amendment, but I'm not quite sure you could track out and say that in all instances, let's say, for example, in the, the Reed versus Gilbert case, um, I, I think that, you know, speech there was, they're applying strict scrutiny, even though we're, we're not talking across the board about um about political speech. So I'm not quite sure that I would say that there is a full-fledged or full-blown function distinction in First Amendment law, although I would say it has been relevant to the court's analysis in different ways. It certainly has been highly relevant in any uh, any cases having to do with campaign finance um, law and those types of restrictions. Yes. Yeah, and again, another interesting body of case law given that it's, I'm not quite sure the court's been entirely clear about um, what standard it's applying at different times. Um, but certainly the fact that it is in the political arena um, has been uh, has been important. Although again, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Without getting into the particulars of specific cases, the specific line of cases, it's hard to talk about it. Uh, but I would say that that certainly is something that um, uh, gives the court um, reason to Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? So I, oh, I, I had a question. Um, so Wolf who's who's this talking? Just so we know. This is Wolf Tottenbach, FedSoc. Okay, thanks, Secretary. Um, so, what is your um, knowledge about junk pr- um, junk printers. So uh, the the concept of three D printers that are able to create the plastic emollients from recycled plastic, like the junk printer name. Um, you know, like uh, maybe like HDP like two and four, like the kind of like the high density plastics um, melted down and used. I know there's been a few ideas, maybe some like. Kickstarters went up for a while, but are, are you aware of any junk printers that are working or uh, functional at this point? You know, I also do work on the foreign emoluments clause. The yes, had emoluments. So the first time everyone's asking about emoluments versus emoluments. So it's, it's funny. Um, I haven't really heard about that. What I would say is that the, um, the number of people who download these files is large. The number of people who actually print these files is minuscule. People don't print it because it's not a very useful thing to do. Um, so I don't I don't know how good printers, bad printers, junk printers actually make a difference. This is mostly ideological in nature. That this is something that people want to print, but there's not much usefulness for them. So I, I don't really know. I'm sorry, Wolfgang. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we need a foreign emollient clause now. My next, uh, my next paper. It's a, it's a ban accepting foreign plastics. All right, other questions about like universities. 
So, like, I know in Texas specifically, like, about maybe two or three years ago, there was the controversy over, like, it was at University of Texas, where, like, the, like, Texas had said, like, you could have, like, guns on campus, and public schools had to abide by it, but yet private schools got to choose on that. What is your take on that, like, in terms of constitutionality, like, versus public versus private? Sure. Well, uh, uh, I think what you're referring to is that about four or five years ago, uh, the Texas legislature required public institutions to allow carry on campus. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's been a single incident from a carry holder. Uh, just maybe okay. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's been zero. In fact, I think Colorado, Montana, and a half of their states allow campus carry. Generally, people with carry license are pretty law abiding, so there's really not an issue. Um, but that statute only applied to public schools. I teach at a private school in, in Texas, and my dean said he would rather resign than allow gun on campus. I'm sure most deans would agree. Uh, so we do not have firearms on our campus. Um, the Supreme Court hasn't said much about the right to carry. In fact, they've turned away every single case involving public carry. There was one case that was on the docket last year that was sort of about moving a gun in public, uh, but the court was, uh, uh, dis- the case was dismissed as moot after New York repealed their law. So we don't really know what the right to carry means, um, but the second amendment is but a floor, right? It's a minimum. Uh, states are always able to add um, rights on top of on top of whatever the Supreme Court says, and Texas has much more robust protections than does, than does the federal constitution. Um, what I would say is I hope at some point the Supreme Court clarifies, um, and maybe with a, with a new justice, maybe they will, uh, that there are um, rights to carry in public and, and, and the government should have um, some duty to give it to you, assuming you pass whatever uh, background checks exist. This is not a discretionary license. Okay. Uh, but but there's just not been much. And, and you know, frankly, I, I the Texas carry thing was a huge blow up at the time. And just yeah. I, I hear nothing about it. I haven't heard anything about it in years. I just assume people yeah. do it. I mean, I, I, I spoke at Texas Tech out in Lubbock in West Texas yeah. about a month ago. And they're like, yeah, we're all carrying. Like, no one even knew about it. But yeah, we're all carrying. You know, okay. the students hosting me, they're carrying. You know, what's the big deal? Yeah. Okay. I just didn't know because, like, I remember, like, I went to Baylor, which is a private school, and like, they didn't allow it. But I know, like, Texas made a big like hoopla about it, and like, professors resigned about it, and things like that. So I just didn't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I, just, I haven't heard news about it in years. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Other questions. Uh, anyone else? Not Matt. I can happy to come back to you. If no one else. All right, Matt, go yeah, for a I second had, one. I had a, well, sorry, I had a question. Please. This is Charles. Oh, Charles, go ahead. Um, so with the rise of more capable 3D printers, is there more scrutiny than on what is uh, sort of, I guess, um, being printed? So say, for instance, um, like even metal statues and things of that sort, are people sort of bringing issues to those things because they're sort of diverting away from other industry and things of that sort. And so I'm wondering if there's like a, a secondary, um, a secondary issue along with uh, 3D printers, especially in particular ones that can print metal uh, with sort of uh, competing industries and seeing where they lie with the whole 3D printing uh, idea. Sure. Sort of like, yeah, it's sure. like steel industry, you know, things like that. Sure, and we're almost at the top of the hour, so we'll, I'll wrap up with this question, and I'd be happy to say it later if anyone has further questions. Um, keep a few things in mind. Manufacturing 3D printer is not cheap. It's expensive. And even the most sophisticated printers are more expensive than a traditional factory. So. 3D printers are not a threat to industry in a sense, you might think, but they are a threat to industry in one limited context, which is counterfeiting, right? If I can print a new pair of LeBron James sneakers or Kobe Bryant sneakers for $15 a part, Nike is not happy, right? If I can print, you know, a $50,000 Birkin bag on a 3D printer and it looks exactly the same as one that comes from a, from a, from a design shop, uh, uh, the, the couture shops are not happy. So I think the biggest threat from 3D printing is not guns, 
but counterfeit materials that look great. And that's actually where there's there's actually some litigation that will happen. It's not over it's not over guns, it's over counterfeit stuff. You know, many years ago, Kanye West actually had a thing on the Kardashian show. It was like, I think the three D printers are dangerous. They're going to steal my sneakers. It's very right. Um, so listen to Kanye. All right, I think I'm done. So then, uh, oh, sorry, just uh, ahead, really please. quick. So then, companies like Glock then are would would they would no one in their right mind is going to 3d print a gun and want to use it to fire at a range it's, it's just it's not <laughs> safe you're going to just blow it up at these are single shot weapons you can't have i mean they're just not they're not safe to use it's, it's very absolutely safe. absolutely thank you so much all right thank you all so much this was fun i'm happy to take your questions as well afterwards thank you uh once again we'd like to Invite anyone to stay for the time that they're available. We can use the chat function or just um, feel free to speak up. We'll see how many interested parties remain and then we'll take it from there. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I had a quick question. Um, I kind of wanted to come back to um, some of what Professor McGreal touched on of this idea, and as well as Professor Blackman on information as speech. And I wondered if either of you had any thoughts on how we can identify when factual speech stops being speech and starts being information. Ah, yeah, I, 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 I think you take that question, and Press McGrill is welcome to, to comment um, as well. Um, one of the lines that we can draw... I is, think Professor Blackman might have... Uh, you oh, kind of froze. He's back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, I think one of the lines you can draw um, is based on functionality versus expressiveness. And, and these are not bright line rules. These are, these are quite variable factors. Um, the code we have in these cases um, is quite expressive. If I were to show it to you, you would see in three dimensions um, beautifully rendered objects. Um, art museums have displayed this code um, on, on exhibit, right? If I gave you a 10 minute tutorial, you could figure out how to read this code and how it translates into these graphical images. Um, there's other kinds of code that's not so expressive. Um, it, what might be called source code, right? Or machine code, where if you read it, it's just zeros and ones, right? It's not meant to be read. It's merely meant to be executed. And I think there's a difference between expressive information on the computer versus purely functional information. I think Professor McGrail has uh, made a similar point earlier. And that's a line the courts have used. Um, most of the people who think about banning 3D printed guns, don't actually stop and think about what the code is and what kind of code this is. And it's far more expressive, far more conveying graphical information than other type of speech a court has upheld. Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the things that's uh, tricky here is, uh, and again, this is not to be um, facetious in any way is that you do hear people in different disciplines refer to the beauty of what they're doing, however mundane it may seem to others. And so that idea of even of it, and I know I, I mentioned that idea of uh, functionality versus, and I think the courts use the phrase at times inherent expressively. So, for example, um, and actually this might be a good example. Uh, mere, some cases say the mere state of being in nudity is not inherently expressive. However, a person can, uh, through new dancing, do something expressive. And so they have noted that there can be, and I guess that comes back to the idea of expressive uh, conduct. That conduct that is, like, for example, I remember we were talking about the gosh, this is only back when I was in law school. A law professor talking about, well, if I just open my umbrella because it's raining, probably not speech. But if I open my umbrella because that was the signal to tell somebody that, um, Now's the time for whatever we plan, blah, blah, blah. That's a communicative act. And so that's what, it's kind of interesting that as Professor Blackman talks about that, is you could, I could see the code being both expressive and non-expressive depending on the content. So, for example, I would think it would be seriously problematic to tell someone they could not display that code 
uh, because for the opportunity to speak to its expressiveness. However, to say that it could not be transferred to someone um, for the purpose of using it to print a gun, that might be different. I mean, again, this is an area, I, I'd say on the one hand, it's an area I have some thoughts about only because I've taught First Amendment. On the other hand, I know the limits of it because I haven't had the opportunity to, to think about it in more detail. But that's sort of one of the things I wonder is, can it be like, make that analogy, but the case law is what comes to mind, to nudity. I mean, this, this code can be expressive and it cannot be expressive depending on the, the context in with, within which we're talking about. Thank you for the question. Well, no, can I ask a quick question for you, Josh, uh, sure. or Professor Blackman? Oh, Josh, is, fine, please, yeah. Okay. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting because you mentioned, and this has sort of occurred to me, is that there, there are a lot of people downloading the code and not printing. Given your work with um, uh, your clients and others in that community, have any sense why they're, why they're downloading? It's ideological. It's, okay. a sim- it's a symbol of resistance. I don't make that point lightly. Um, no, Absolutely. It's a symbol of sticking to the man that you cannot stop me. You cannot control me. Um, uh, There's a popular current of anarchism in our society, and it's a viewpoint of politics that people have. And it's the idea that you cannot stop the signal, so to speak. As people download it for the sole sake of having it. Um, There's also a community that actually likes to design the files, to tweak the files, edit the files kind of in an open source fashion. They make modifications, they make revisions, they, they move this around, they, you know, they, they do things to it. it it's almost like, it, it's an art. I don't, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. I, I frankly don't. But for some people, this is considered um, beauty to, to make this elegant design that functions with as few as parts as possible, right? As few as cuts, as few as, you know, just the most smooth, you know, think of like the iPhone, Johnny Ives, right? These people who design these, these devices with, you know, one part, like, you know, they get even smaller and smaller and smaller with fewer and fewer components. And it's considered a skill. I don't, I don't have that. I can't relate to it. I don't, I don't get it, but for a lot of people, it's art. And it really, it really makes them happy to design these, these files. Even they never actually print them up. So yeah, I was actually uh, Control Pew, who has joined us today, is actually in the industry of uh, 3D guns. I, I don't know if you could tell from his name, but uh, he actually had a question from earlier. Do you have any thoughts to the FGC nine or more recent hybrid designs of 3D printed guns? Um, you know, I, I think he's referring to some of the more more uh, modern designs, which are by hybrid. I think mean part metal, part plastic. Is that what you're getting at? So once you recognize that plastic guns are not a very good idea. You say, okay, well, we'll yeah, exactly. mix yep. plastic and metal. Okay, and once you say you're mixing plastic and metal, well, then it'll get detected in metal detectors. The entire point's stupid, right? The, the entire fear of plastic guns is they're undetectable. And once you put metal in there, they're detectable. So it's like any other gun. Um, are they ser- serialized? Does it have serial numbers? No, but most homemade guns will have serial numbers. Um, so it, it's, it's, again, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of plastic guns are undetectable? Or are you afraid of people making guns at home, which are detectable, but not going to be registered, right? I think there are different fears. And if your concern is people making metal guns at home that are not registered, then the plastic gun thing is stupid. There's so many better ways of milling your own weapon uh, than, 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 than downloading these files. Um, so again, pick your poison. What is it that you're afraid of? I will humbly submit that the fear of purely plastic guns, 100% plastic guns, is not a very useful item. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can probably take one more question and then we'll be wrapping up. I wanted to thank Professor McGrill and Professor Blackman again. Uh, Hallie, did you want to say anything? No, I think I've got everything. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Creighton. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for all being here. If there are no last minute questions, I think the additional Q&A time was um, really good to be able to add. So thank you for Professor McGreal and Professor Blackman for um, sticking on a few minutes longer to ask a few additional questions. This always feels like the part of our events where we just always want more time and there are always more good questions. So I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who hopped on, including some of our guests who were not Creighton students, but who were interested in the topic and wanted to learn more. Hopefully it was beneficial to you as well. Um, yeah, well, I just hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Right.
um, 